Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear podcast number 235. Another great week, I hope, for everyone. If not, don't worry, the week is over, so we can start the weekend, talk about guitar, other subjects. Today's show will have some all kinds of stuff. It'll have some all kinds of stuff. I don't know if that was two sentences I just decided to blend together, but trust me, it makes sense in my head. That's right, we have to talk about all kinds of things. Uh, so first up, uh, uh, while people are kind of coming on the live, I'll tell you what happened last week. So I mentioned last week I had to start the show a little early and leave a little early. Although, you know, because I started it early, we left early. Uh, it's because my daughter is uh, going to be 17. And what happened was she turned 16 during COVID. Obviously, it's still COVID, but you know what I mean, when during the lockdown. And for her birthday, we had some stuff planned for her 16th birthday, and none of that could happen. Obviously, this is last year. And then on top of that, she, even though she uh, went to driving school and got everything for her driver's license, she couldn't have her driver's license in time because of the way COVID was set up. So she couldn't even start driving you know, <laughs> right after her birthday uh, like she wanted. So to make it up to her, we said, hey, next year when you're 17, we'll take you uh, and do whatever you want. And she said, hey, can we go to Disneyland? I live in Arizona. It's like a seven-hour drive to Disneyland. We're like, yeah, let's go to Disneyland. And our plan was to go for the day. She just wanted to check out the Star Wars thing. She hadn't seen it. And as you guys know, if you guys have been watching the show, you know my wife basically broke her foot. So it's in a boot thing. So we couldn't go to Disneyland. <laughs> so you can imagine, uh, I'm sure it's been a tough time for her. Uh, <laughs> it's like a birthday is not going to happen. So at the last minute we go, we got to do something. So what I ended up doing was we got tickets for her. She loves John Mulaney. He's a stand-up comedian and he was playing and uh, he was performing Friday night. So we left Friday night. So that's what I did. I had to leave early, go downtown Phoenix to go see the show. It was a great show. We had a good time. Although like probably half, maybe not half, 40% half of the audience was a little late to the show because it was a lot of a lot, a long process to get in the show. Um, they, they, uh, you know, you had to sh either show your uh, your shot card to show you got shots or uh, your vaccine, or you had to show a 48 hour test uh, that you had been tested. Then once you go through that, they got to you know kind of go through security, pat you down. Then after that, because it's a stand up show, they got to put your phone in a bag if you haven't experienced this. Um, a bag, it's like a, I think neoprene is what I would call it, like a neoprene, like wetsuit material. You put your phone in a neoprene envelope, you turn off the ring or you can turn off the phone, you put it in this envelope and then they like magnet lock it shut and then they have essentially the device that can unlock it. So for the whole show, your phone's locked. I actually enjoyed that. Uh, so, you know, I think that's great. Um, you know, you didn't have to worry about anybody ruining the time, you know, holding the phone in front of their face the whole time or anything like that. But that process took a long, but it was a great show. He was uh, very funny. My daughter had an amazing time. And uh, and so that was my way of compromising. I told the family, I said, hey, I'll, I'll go on 30 minutes early. And uh, so now you guys know what I did. <laughs> so so um, there you go. <laughs> that's the whole that's the whole story. Great, great show. Um, yeah, Sean says, so you can't try and record the show and upload it. Yeah, you know, I they weren't recording the show that night themselves. So sometimes they don't want to record it because that maybe they don't want it out there. I'm sure all those are definitely the reasons. But I think a little bit, believe it or not, was I think some of these um, comedians, artists, uh, it's not like a rock concert where it's loud. You know, these phones ringing, people texting, that stuff disturbs the artists in the audience. I'm actually... Look, it, the only thing that sucked about the entire thing is we didn't know they were going to bag our phones. We didn't see anywhere in the literature, and it maybe was out there, and we just missed it. But now that I know that, I wouldn't bring my phone. <laughs> so, you know, we'd probably bring one phone, uh, you know, up and then leave that in the car. You know what I mean? Uh, but, no, I, I like it. <laughs> I like the idea. I would rather not have my phone. Look, the pictures you take of the sh show, uh, I don't do that anyways. <laughs> I don't usually take a whole lot of pictures anyway. So, there you go. So I, uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it more. And I, I, so that was my, there's my take on that. I enjoy the idea. And if a, a musician start doing it, then so be it. Um, the other thing I want to point out to you is that we're going to do, like I said last week, we did a guitar crate giveaway last week on the show. We're going to be giving a guitar crate away today on the show. But, but we're going to do something a little special starting now <laughs> after this show. Um, there's a link down below. You can enter to win next week's 
uh, guitar crate, which will be a hundred dollar gift crate. So it's going to be a better, uh, better box than the normal forty-five dollar one. Obviously, double. It's like getting two of the crates. So you just click the link and 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 do that, and then I will pick the winner, uh, or the randomizer will pick the winner. Uh, I should say. Uh, before the show next week, and I'll announce it next week. The reason I'm doing that is I don't want to keep picking the names. Like, you know, last week it was great. I picked a name. Today I'm going to pick somebody the same, different kind of way than I did last week. But it would just be easier. To me, it's a lot easier. Uh, since I've been doing giveaways with the guitars and stuff, it's a lot easier to have this randomizer. Just You push a button, and it just tells me who's the winner. And then that way I don't have to worry about, like, you know, why did I pick that name? What's going on with that? By the way... If you are curious, um, the winner of the D'Angelico guitar that I gave away, the one I reviewed from Sweetwater, uh, was picked today. The randomizer picked Mitchell. Uh, and what I do, I always do this the same way. I email them, and because I don't know the name. The randomizer doesn't even give me your names. It just tells me what email address won. So in this case, Mitchell's email address was presented to me. I sent him a message. Uh, what did it say? I'm going to read it to you. It said... Oh, the, the subject was my D'Angelico DC Mini. It's because I can't put anything contest in the subject because a lot of people's, uh, uh, what do you call it, the spam <laughs> will grab the email. So I put my D'Angelico DC Mini, and then it put in the subject, that's the subject, and then in the body of the uh, email it says, is now yours. You won. And so it says, as soon as you respond and tell me the address, uh, I'll make the announcement. So he gave me an address. He's in Pennsylvania. So... He's going to get the guitar. Mitchell, if you're watching the show right now, congratulations, buddy. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are happy for you and some not so happy for you, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> that matters. You're going to be getting the uh, levy strap and the gator stand. I threw some New Year gear stickers and stuff in there, and um, it's an all-in-one box. What I don't know is when it goes out. Here's what I did. It's already boxed up and ready to go. It'll either go out tomorrow or Monday. That'll be up to my wife, and my knowing my wife, she probably won't let it go until Monday because she says... When you ship on a Friday afternoon or Saturday, a lot of times it just shits in a uh, shits <laughs> ships in a, ships and then it goes to a warehouse. It does the other thing too. <laughs> Was that a Freudian slip? Whoopsies. Little okay. So yeah. <laughs> so so Mitchell. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I'll send you the tracking number. Uh, in fact, uh, as soon as she gives me the tracking number, I forward it just like on the mirror guitar for Sam. Okay. Congratulations, buddy. Now. The other thing I want to discuss is we're going to do some guitar stuff at the halfway mark in the show. I got to share something with you. It happened this week. <clears throat> I don't even know how to share it with you. How do I say? I, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, pretty, pretty freaking amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, yep. I, I don't even know. I don't even want to, I don't want to talk about it until the middle of the show. So let's just, uh, let me get into some questions and then you'll know what's going on because it's going to be. I don't know. It's gr it's just powerful for me. Okay, so what do we have? Let's uh, let's uh, look at the early birds. The early birds came to the show. We got to come up with a better name than early birds. I feel like you all will get twenty percent off breakfast at Denny's for being an early bird. What's up, Doc? W with W Z's to W U two Z's. What's up, Doc? Says, can you talk about the new Fender Player Plus? Why some people think it's too much money. Some people think everything's too much money. <laughs> it's, some of it's uh, based on their wallet. Some of it's based on educated opinions because you know what the market can bear. Some of it's just based on, you know, nothing. <laughs> so in this case, uh, look, man, it is tough right now. Uh, it is tough. It's not just inflation. Obviously, that's tough to take in. But you got to understand, uh, I, one thing I can tell you uh with the videos that I made over the years, uh, considering my channel didn't technically start, I started my channel around 2015, 16. I started putting some videos up. I think my first videos hit 2014. So you understand it's like a couple spatters of videos out there, really not doing anything with it. I always tell people, uh, you know, officially my channel starts for me, 2017, April of 2017, actually is when I go, okay, I'll make video in a, you know, consistently and I'll, and I'm going to try to be a YouTube you know, channel, you know what I mean? Or a podcast or whatever I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do this. This is going to be a thing for me. Um, but that being said, when you look back now at the years of the videos I've done, I mean, it's not 10 year old videos, which is crazy. There are videos where it's like, 
hey, this you can get for $1,000. And now you look and it's 15. This you, uh, So it's tough. Um, when I started making videos, I'm sure there's a video of me doing a Mexican made standard strat and it was probably 450. So, uh, and again, this isn't, there's no decade here. There's no, the channel's not 10 years old. The channel's barely six, seven years old. So, I mean, it's crazy. So yeah, the Fender Players Plus, I think there's a little shell shock in that. People aren't prepared to pay that. But here's the deal. We know what's going to happen. Soon, in our lifetimes, made in Mexico guitars will be the price of American made guitars, and American made guitars will be the price of custom shop guitars. That's all that's going to go. And then custom shop guitars, that'll be this even crazier. That is, <coughs> excuse me, that is absolutely uh, how it's going to go. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. That's why I make a point to always do as many different price points as I can on the channel. Used gear, new gear, cheap gear, expensive gear. Kind of get the word out about all the other gear. But, yeah, it's tough. Uh, but I'm sure, me personally, I still think the Made in Mexico stuff, whether it's Charvel, whether it's uh, EVH, whether it's the Jackson, whether it's Fender, it's still some of the best gear and the price points are pretty friendly. Uh, for what it is. I think it's good stuff. So I don't know. That's my that's my essential take on the on that. I still think it's priced relatively relatively right. I mean I'm not happy that it's more, but relatively speaking it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna do this one just because Mr. Bigfoot 1951 says Phil seventh time seventh time that I've asked this, maybe I will get an answer. You will. See? Seventh time to charm, Mr. Bigfoot, 1951. This time. He says, Lab Series L5 is my main amp. Okay. Any thoughts? I have lots of thoughts. Because <laughs> I love the five amps uh, and the 13 axes. Uh, yep. I'm just making sure that says what I think it does. Uh, yeah. L5, the, the lab series L5 amps. I know very little about them. This is what I know. I probably played one once. Um, this is what I think I know about that amp. It's solid state. I think BB King used one or, you know, uh, well, I know he used one. I think I'm pretty sure that, but I don't know if it was his main amp or if he just used it sometimes. Um, I know blues players that have used them. Uh, the one I plugged in and played, I remember thinking it was pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, um, it was one of those I like, plugged in and went, wow, that's nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a lot of amps. There's a lot of nice amps. Um, and I, I think I liked it. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, so to answer your question, my thoughts on it are, I think BB King used it. So anything he used, it's got to be good, period. Um, or if it wasn't good, he made it sound good. But I remember plugging into it, getting a good sound out of it right away. Not, you know, like I said, I'm not a tube snob by any means. Uh, solid state tube digital. They all have a place of what I like and why I like them. So, you know, I prefer tube. And when I say prefer tube in, my personal choices tend to be tube amps. So obviously I prefer them. But I own solid state amps as well, digital amps as well. I use them all. It just depends on what I'm doing and what I'm looking for and what I want out of it. I like to tell you that tube amps, and this is something maybe ties in this, tube amps for me are one, usually one of two things. And one of those things don't exist anymore. <laughs> but it is one, for me, it's one of two things, but one thing doesn't exist anymore. One, they're very loud. So that was like, you know, when you used to compete for volume to be loud in bands, uh, you know, <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, what do you call it? It, it? Tube amps helped, you know. I have a... Uh, story. I had a Randall 100 watt head, solid state, played in a band. The other guitar player had a 100 watt Marshall, and you couldn't even hear me on stage. So that was the day I learned that 100 watts uh, solid state is not the same as 100 watts too, because he was just killing me. Uh, you couldn't hear any of me, any of what I was, uh, you know, what I was playing. He was just so much louder than me. The uh, so loud is one thing, but that's not a thing I, I go after anymore and I care about. So the other thing that tubes do is they have a tone and a feel that I find pleasing. I don't really need them for my audience. I'm a, I'm a true believer when people tell me like, I, I can use a, you know, an ax effects and play in the, in the audience that can't tell. Absolutely. I, I absolutely don't think the audience can tell. And I've said this a million times over. That's why I don't believe gear is for the audience. 
Uh, gear is for the artist. That's 100% what I believe. Just like I think uh, cooking utensils are for the chef and not for the not for the patron who's going to eat the food. I can't tell you uh, if I ate some carrots and I went, oh, these were sliced with a $600 Japanese knife. I could totally tell by the way the curvature of the cut tastes in my mouth. Nope. Can't tell. So if the chef wants a $600 knife and the food is good, then damn it, he should get it, or he or she should get a $600 knife and make good food. <laughs> so same thing with gear. If uh, you can make great sounds in a band with a Line 6 uh, a spider amp, or if you need a uh, $4,000 uh, two rock amp. I don't care. As long as what I'm listening to is pleasant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't care. So, uh, as the audience now, and like I said, so that's why I said for two amps, when I like two amps, I tend to, it's for me. Uh, cause like, like I said, I can kind of simulate what I want it to sound like to the audience. So there you go. <laughs> BC rich 581 says pre CBS knives. I'm sure that's a discussion somewhere, by the way, I'm absolutely look, I don't know anything about chefs. Um, I know uh, I know that they're, they use expense. I have a friend who who who's a, a chef, and I know uh, she uh, likes uh, expensive Japanese knives. <laughs> so so I'm like I know that's a thing. So that's why I grabbed it as a, as an analogy. However, what I will say is um, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's an argument. I'm sure at some point the Japanese knife company went from more of like a machine process and less of a hand process. I'm just guessing, of course. And now the chefs are like, oh, you have a pre, you know, 86 <laughs> knife. Uh, cause it all translates everywhere you go. These discussions we're having today about the stuff we love. Everybody's having on somewhere on YouTube about their stuff they love. I reached out. Remember I told you guys a couple weeks ago, I said I was thinking about getting a new hobby and I was wondering if the other hobbies had these same kind of people, conversations in them. And some of you guys reached out and confirmed that, that it is true. So I'm like, yeah, of course. Um, okay. Uh, and I know I have super chats. I will definitely get to those. Robert Powell says four times now I have asked you a question. No, he's not talking to me. He says four times now I have contacted Sweetwater and asked for a deal. All four times. <laughs> I don't know why I'm reading it like this. Uh, I met with a no wiggle room. Really? <laughs> like, I'm just laughing because that's what they said. There's just no wiggle room, sir. There's no wiggle room. Anyways, he says, time to change Sweetwater reps. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Look, um, my son's grabbing a box for me today uh, that came in. I bought a bunch of stuff from Sweetwater this week. Um, after uh, having the uh, last show's uh, last week's show, when I talked about why I love the music Nomad Ruler, my wife <laughs> watched the show, and which which is because I made her. It's not like she was watching it. I was let, making her watch the show for stuff. And she says, okay, if you love that thing so much, how come that isn't in the uh, swag bag that goes to the to patrons when they sign up? And I go, I don't know. So we ordered uh, these. I ordered... Uh, I think I did 15 of them. I can't remember. So, but it was at least 15. And I did 15 of these and then other stuff I need. And so, you know, I sent, didn't call, didn't ask. I sent my rep, Brent, a email on Monday saying, hey, I need 15 Music Nomad uh, string action rulers. I believe these were $17. <laughs> now I'm like walking down this path going, do I tell out the... Uh, the people that I'm sending these to, I got a discount because now they're going to be like, hey, it's not going to add up to the value. But it is. They were 17 bucks. I didn't know at the time, by the way. Remember last week's show? I said, I don't know what these cost because they sent me one for free. Um, I looked it up. It's like 16, 17 bucks. So I sent him an email and I said, uh, do you have, in fact, I should pull up the exact email and see how I worded it. Do you have a discount, a, like a bulk discount? I don't think I phrased it that way. Um, I think I said, if I buy 15 of these, you have a discount for me buying multiples of the same item. And uh, he said, yes. And he gave me a quote and uh, uh, it was $13 a piece. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, hey, there's the math. Three, three, four bucks off each. That was pretty good, right? So times 15, 40, 50 bucks off in my pocket. So when I send these out to my patrons, uh, that's 50 bucks in my pocket that I can used to buy more Funko Pop heads, <laughs> more toys. Anyways, uh, so here's my point. Uh, he absolutely did it for me. Now, what I don't know in your uh, story is, 
you know, you ask four times, did you ask like for a Mesa Boogie? And they're like, we don't, you know, because you can understand there's products that are just going to have no wiggle room. If it's back ordered and they can't get it, are they motivated to sell it? If it's a brand that's really hardcore about it, Mason Boogie is pretty hardcore about don't giving, not giving discounts. Um, not as hardcore as it used to be. Um, and I can, if you guys are curious, I'll tell you, I, like I've dealt with some hardcore companies. Zon Bases uh, ju- uh, was the most aggressive when it came to don't ever discount your stuff. Um, Mike Fulton from Full Tone Pedals, very aggressive with not discounting, by the way. He's hardcore. I have an email to this day from him, and he's like, don't even, I don't care if it's your brother-in-law. I kind of want to, why am I making him sound like a curmudgeonly ass? I'm sorry. <laughs> but the email was kind of curmudgeonly. He basically said, I don't care if it's your brother-in-law, no discounts. <laughs> I remember going, uh, all right, I don't, I don't even, uh, my brother-in-law doesn't play guitar. We're fine. So anyways, um, what's my, what's my point? Back to the subject. It's going to be important that I stay on subject. Okay, Robert. Um, so what I'm saying is contact my rep, Brent. <laughs> I don't know. Any of you. I don't care. Right? What do I get? I don't work for Sweetwater. Um, so, you know, with Brent, he's always nice to me. I always send him emails. Like I told you, for a little while, I didn't think he knew that I was on this, you know, I was doing this channel. Now he's definitely knows, mostly because I think you guys tell him, like, hey, I have Phil McKnight, too. Um, yeah, call Sweetwater and go, hey, I want to talk to Brent. And when he gets on the phone, go, hey, Brent, you're the guy, you're, you're Phil McKnight, Sweetwater rep, and I, I want a discount. And then when he tells you no wiggle room, then you can tell me next week. <laughs> and I'll be like, I don't know. Um, in fact, if you want to know what he looks like, I learned this uh, over time. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> I'm learning this. Every time I do screen grabs, of Sweetwater screens for the videos. Cause you know, I, anytime I'm like, when I did the giveaway, like here's the screen. I think cause I'm logged in to Sweetwater when I'm doing that, it puts his face. So when every time you see the rep's face, I think that's my rep. Isn't that funny? I never thought to ask him that, but I'm pretty sure it is. So uh, Robert, uh, yeah, new Sweetwater rep or just ask, you know, like I said, ask Brent. He gives me, I don't ask for ridiculous stuff. So don't ask him for ridiculous stuff. Cause uh, well, I mean, you can <laughs> actually take that back. Ask him for whatever you want. I'm just telling you what works for me. I didn't tell him what I wanted. I just said, hey, if I buy a bunch of these, is there a deal? He gave me a deal. So you know, I bought a bunch of picks as well. I think I bought 15 of the uh, Primetone picks and 15 of the uh, Herco picks, because again, those are the picks I use. And uh, I did not ask him for a deal. Because I, you know, I I just didn't do it. He might have done it. I didn't really look at the invoice, to be honest with you. Uh, it came in and, you know, to me, it's, it's, I have a business. So it's like, oh, it was like $357, $357 or whatever. It was three something. And I send that off to my wife, who's basically the accountant. And I say, yeah, yeah, you got to pay this. <laughs> and then I go, and, I, and then I go, that stuff you wanted is on your way. And then I got to go back to what I got to get done. So that's my long uh, story to tell you. Uh, yeah, call a different rep, call my rep, call somebody. Uh, and then ultimately, like I said, I like Sweetwater. Um, and I always tell you guys, uh, if you click the links down below in the videos, I get a kickback from Sweetwater, like any channel that has affiliate with them. But as I always tell you guys, just call them and get a deal. Keep the money yourself. So trust me, that's the whole point of making videos. Every once in a while I get lucky and a video goes viral, a bunch of people that don't know the channel watch it and click the links. And those really probably fill it up more than anybody else. So like I said, you save your money. I appreciate it. Uh, you guys just watching and hanging out. So, okay, uh, we have more more questions. I do I do have a couple of the pinned ones uh, from the beginning, and I'll come back to those that I thought were interesting. Let me let me catch some some super chats. By the way, another thing that's cool is if you saw the new intro thumbnail, which I have right here. Let me show you one second. Uh, is uh, I had it, sorry, I had it fast, but I don't have a mic hooked up to that screen. Each of these screens have to, I have to sign a mic to it. I didn't have a mic signed to it. So um, uh, I'll show it to you guys again. Uh, that was uh, Joe at Rat Pack Records, uh, who's a, a good buddy uh, and great friend of the show, made me a thumbnail for me on Photoshop, sent it to me. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. It's kind of like, I'm going to point at it right now to the, page, the uh, podcast people won't know. I don't know how to point. <laughs> I want because I want to point for. Oh, look at that! I'm pointing at it right now. I'm pointing at a little MXR looking pedal. A viewer made this icon for me, um, so you know uh, that fan funded thing to show that this uh, show is funded by the patrons. So um, years ago, I made some really bad 
<laughs> graphic logos and then a, a viewer uh, just like uh, Joe basically reached out and said here's a better one I did on Photoshop I'm like oh cool and I use those so I appreciate you guys for that so uh, it's awesome so why I don't have a team of editors so every time you guys are like this is wrong I'm like okay I'll fix it <laughs> I don't have a team I don't have a director I don't have a film crew I don't have anything it's just just me and my wife who's crazy enough to do some of the stuff for the patrons and ship for me so, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read this out of order. Thunder Falcon says, light up those bad cat amps. You know what's funny about that? I did. <laughs> they were lit up when I was going to do this today. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. They're too bright. They uh, basically glare out uh, the, the camera. So it you can't even read it says bad cat. It just looks uh, like a white little blur. So they're just too bright for this camera because the room is dark. Like I said, I'm lit up with these uh, lighting and this lighting. And so the rooms, uh, like I told you guys, one of the things you uh, you learn making so much content is that a lot of times, you know, everything's lit up like like on just like in the movies. So it looks like it's normal, but it's not. Right now, like if I hold, I don't have a piece of paper. I have a napkin. <laughs> if I was a little piece of paper like here, I could barely read it. It's how dark it is in here. I have to kind of, I have to move it this way so I can see the light, see the light here. But as soon as I turn here, it gets darker. And by the time I get here, I couldn't, I barely read this. It's dark. Um, so there you go. So the movie magic. I don't want to ruin it for you, but <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, we, we need to do Litve. Litve says Strat pickup. Okay was installed directly into the body. Oh, direct mount pickup, gotcha. Okay, so I'm assuming you mean like a single coil or a uh, strap pickup, I'm saying a single coil. He says directly into the body with a wood screw. Now I want to use it with a pick guard, but the screw holes are too big, what to do? Um, yeah, that's easy. Let me, let me try. This is tough because a strap pickup's different. Let me type in, and I'll show you guys. Mini humbucker. Um, nut? Sure. And then try Stu Mac. But you can get it at a hardware store. I'm, I just want to show you one. I just want to know where I can find one. And there you go. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let me show you this to you. Check it out. There, here you go. So what this is is a nine cent thing. But, you know, it's Stu Mac, so it would be nine cents plus ten dollars to ship it. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, yeah, this is what you need. Um, what I would do, so this is for, this one's probably for the type of screw. In fact, they might have, yeah, look at that. They always do this kind of stuff. This is why I like Stu Mac. Um, you can find, uh, by the way, use Stu Mac. Uh, if you don't use their tools, use at least their website as a resource. They make all these crazy stuff and then do yourself a favor. Look, I, I, like I've said before, I've spent a fortune in Stu Mac over the years because because when you're doing stuff and getting paid for it, it really breaks down the cost of the stuff fast. You know, when you have to pay, a, you know, when you pay Stu Mac $500 and you can make, uh, you know, $1,000 in a week doing repairs, you're like, hey, this kind of pays it off really fast. However, uh, that being said, um, you, use, you can use Stu Mac's website as a template to find, pro you know, things like here, a 64 cent screw. Maybe you can find it cheaper somewhere else. So these are for humbuckers. You said uh, a single coil, but I need to show you what at least you're looking for. What you want to do is go get yourself a, uh, I would just go, in, you're in a different country, but I would really go, let me go back. I was pushing the wrong thing. Let me go back to me. I would go uh, to a hardware store. Take the screw uh, for that you know, the size, right? Take it to your hardware store and find a screw that's like that, a non-wood screw, of course, and get that in a matching nut. Put the nut behind the bottom of the pick, uh, the pickup and just do that and it'll work. If you really want to make your life uh, easy, uh, I would also uh, put a dot of super glue. So I take the nut, line it up with the, uh, the holes that are in the bottom of the, the pickup. So Let's pretend this is the base of the pickup and you have two holes drilled through on each side. I would put the nut underneath, center it up so it looks, you know, so the holes line up perfect. Put one dot, maybe two dots on each side of super glue. Okay, so it holds there and then run the screws through that. Do that. Absolute easy fix. Uh, and if you go to, if they have hardware stores where you are like they do here, you can walk in there and literally uh, get somebody to help you and walk out for like, 38 cents. I'm not even exaggerating. I just did it 
I had a mounted TV on the wall, and Ralph helped me this was a couple weeks ago, and we went to the Ace Hardware, and it was literally like a doll to thirty four, and the kid came. There was a kid this time. Usually it's a usually an old older gentleman who's helped, but this guy was a kid. He's a long haired kid, and he's helped us. Spent five ten minutes, which based on minimum wage in my state means they lost about six dollars helping me <laughs> to make my dollar uh, purchase. But hey, they still do it. God bless them. So that's what I would do. Do that stuff. Uh, so. Uh, there you go. Susan says, I just uh, I just found my hobbies, Swiss Army Knives. They are great. This one is a Swiss Army Knife that I've had forever, and it was chewed on by a dog. <laughs> I don't know which one of my dogs. Oh, no. I'm sorry. This predates my dogs. This is a cat. If you could see the little teeny cat teeth in it. I had a cat chew off. Look at that. Like, that's a, like I always thought to this day, like, what was that cat? Like, what? <laughs> Right? Like, that cat really wanted this thing. And, uh, yeah, chewed it up. Still works this day, which is why I like stuff like this. I love stuff you can just buy, torture, and keep forever. It's awesome. Okay. There's my Swiss Army knife. And sponsored by a Swiss Army knife, I wish. Antique Rocker says, wiring two humbuckers into a three-way switch. One tone, one volume. Kit diagram shows all ground soldered to the volume pot with, with ground to bridge. With ground to bridge. Why not solder ground wires separately if, if and wait, separately and if needed, one run to pot? Yeah, you can do that. It's ground. Once it's all touching, it's all touching. Do it however you want. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. You, you can do, you know, you can do it however you want. As long as they're grounded, they're grounded. Ground is ground. It's super easy. It's not, uh, they, they're just, you know. So, you know, I've written many diagrams over the years. Um, you know, we share them publicly. You know, that's what happens, right? So so guitar techs across the, the whole planet Earth, you know, you solve a problem, you write a diagram. Nowadays, uh, you know, I've, I've been around long enough to where it predates when Seymour Duncan and, and uh, what was it, uh, Guitar Labs and everybody else started printing, you know, are putting, di you know, uh, diagrams out. You know, before, <laughs> before the Internet... Literally, you would get your diagrams in those pickups, but, you know, you'd buy a used Seymour Duncan and there would be no diagram and then there was no internet to go to. So you just start keeping diagrams. And then, you, you know, when the internet start, started, we started putting them all out there. Um, so a lot of diagrams that I've drawn over the years have literally just because, I, I mean, I literally wrote them slightly different than how I did them because, you know, Sometimes they're only in black and white, <laughs> so you want you know you want people to see the thing. So sometimes a diagram actually is not hundred percent accurate. It just makes more sense as a diagram than it did physically there. That's why I tell you guys all the time when you're working on guitars, get out those cell phones and take some pictures. In fact, like I said, do, that's just the rule for everything now. You work on anything. I don't care what it is, right? You unplug the cables behind your TV. Take a picture first. Just have you know why? Why not? Pictures are free. You don't have to develop them now. You don't. You know your camera is always with you. Take a picture. Have it in there later if you have a problem. You have a resource to go back to. Definitely with guitars. If I take anything apart on a guitar, I'll take a picture. Uh, the only exception to that is you know this is what happens. You do something enough times. Sometimes you don't take a picture. Like I I could do this in my sleep, so I wouldn't. I don't do that. But if you've never done it before. Definitely take those pictures. Okay. And I hope that was the core of your question. That's what I got from it. But uh, but I appreciate it. Thank you, Antique Rock Rocker. Um, okay. So Happy Go Lucky says... I love all the weird spellings. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Antique Rocker had a capital R-O-C and then small K-E-R. Happy Go Lucky is L-U-K-K-Y. I love this. <laughs> Instead of C-K-Y. Okay. Anyways. Uh, it says, love the show and finish the podcast. Okay. I'm gassing for an SG. They are awesome. Any Gibson years to avoid things to watch out uh, in the used market specific to the SGs. Um, you know, the, the, if you don't have an SG, there's not a whole lot to worry about. If you have an SG, I will tell you this, um, finding two SGs that are alike is really tough. Um, as you know, I just recently bought my green one and it's amazing, but it's, even though it's specked out almost exactly like my, uh, my tobacco burst one, um, I don't know if that's the actual name of it, but it's a tobacco burst. 
they are still slightly, slightly different in the feel of the neck and stuff. And, and obviously different block inlays. It's weird, like I said. So no, um, if you like the thicker necks, go to the 50 style, just like Gibson. So if you like the thinner necks, go to the 60 style. That's pretty much it. Um, I will tell you that I found no dividend to paying more for the SGs. In other words, you know, if you buy the $3,000 SGs, I pick those up and I don't feel anything that's like, oh, you know, uh, you know, so picking up an SG is, uh, and, and if you can b get one of those satin finished, you know, uh, specials, those are great. I have a, uh, SG with two P nineties in it. And, um, you know, I picked it up, picked it up dirt cheap and it's just as good as my other SGs. And it's got slightly thicker 50 style C shape to it. It's really good. So nothing really worry about obviously with Gibson, <laughs> I was going to say, obviously with Gibson, you're going to get flaws. Even my SG, the one you guys keep seeing in videos, I should show you guys. I can't show you here because it wouldn't come out in the camera, but I should show you in a video. There's like, they taped off around the nut and they went too far. When we peeled the tape off, there's no finish on the neck. Like, <laughs> and they clear coated over it. It's, it's so obnoxious that you expect to see that on like a hundred, $200 guitar, maybe, uh, but not a real, you know, American made, you know, high end Gibson. Um, so yeah, you're going to see flaws. That's part of the charm of a Gibson. I know that sounds kind of like a marketing spin on that, but it is reality of it. That's one of the things I don't care about. I've learned that one good thing about being consistent with being inconsistent is that there is this, there is this, <laughs> I want to say there is a consistent, no, there is this like pass they get. And I know that because as if you bought and sold any Gibsons in your in your travels, you know, of, over the years, it's like people really don't scrutinize them. Try to selling a used PRS, man. You you'll have somebody going through it, you know, and every little mark means something to the cost. But Gibsons, you can be like, oh yeah, they put the logo on upside down, and people are like, yeah, they, they do that, <laughs> and, then, and then they just buy it from you. Uh, so um, yeah, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Like I said, find something cool. Don't forget Epiphones too. Very cool. Uh, like I said, I like both, but I, I told you I buy the SGs because, um, I, I know Gibson's, I know when I, when I see a good price on a Gibson and I buy it, I know I can always get my money back. And so that makes it easy to, to dabble in that market. Epiphones, you have to buy them pretty cheap because they fluctuate like crazy. Sometimes they're worth more than sometimes they're worth less depending on what's going on. Um, and then Matthew's uh, saying, hey, look at the headstock for breaks. Sure, I have a whole video on, you know, going through used guitars and stuff. Always uh, check every guitar for headstock breaks and stuff like that. That's, you know, all that stuff. You can use a black light on the Gibsons. It depends. Like I said, it depends on how, you know, careful we want to go. But if you're looking at new ones, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But used ones, I would definitely inspect everything on it to make sure. But I've always stick with this as much as I've done those uh, on those videos. I'm pretty sure I say this too when I talk about all the things you can inspect. And I have inspection sheets on the links in those videos, so you can get download the PDFs if you want something to write out. Um, I always tell people if you're buying used, always try to get a sense of the seller. The seller will tell you everything. You know what I mean? Because really, what you want to know is is this a person who's just trying to sell you something and get out of there and, and they're done, one and done, go. And if they are, then you need a deal. That's my experience. I don't even travel that road unless I know I'm getting a smoking deal. Um, as soon as I know that, because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be left with this, you know, guitar, and then you, they don't care, and that happens a lot. But if I'm dealing with a credible seller or somebody I think has a as a good person, <laughs> because I've met them or I know them or I've interacted with them and they're giving the right vibes, huh, I go down that road with the purchase. But I re I look at the seller more than I look at the actual guitar or the product, and I've always done that, and I always feel like that 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 pays a good dividend. Like I told you guys, if you meet somebody at Craigslist in the parking lot, as soon as you sense you they're they're not on the up and up, don't buy it. It's just you know, I'm not saying you should go and waste people's time, but also be you know be aware they they're giving you the vibe there's probably something wrong you know trust your instincts it's how we used to survive being eaten by wolves <laughs> hey i don't think i should go in the forest at night with those glowing eyes those who thought like that live those who didn't eh, they're, they're, they're not here anymore uh meester says happy kyg friday gonna use your video and install the trimmel no oh um i need a strauss ibanez uh, that's awesome uh love the guitar but hate tuning a floyd absolutely uh thanks uh uh and he's uh so basically yeah of course yeah there's nothing wrong i always say this and i always say this when it comes to floyd rose floyd rose, floyd rose style guitars like i have one behind me it was a floyd the sinister gates 
some people, I have all kinds of videos, like all kinds of channels have good videos uh, out there like this, but I have videos like how to set up your Floyd, how to restring your Floyd Rose, how to block your Floyd. And I always remind everybody, if your first time with a Floyd Rose, block it. Just start there. Trust me, get a feel for it. You gotta, you know what I mean? It's a lot to take in. Some people really fear the Floyd Rose bridge. Um, I can understand why, but really once you understand it, you won't, you know what I mean? And and so a lot of times you get that kind of grief from players, like, ah, oh, you can't figure it out, it's super easy. It's not super easy, but you can figure it out. Uh, super easy in comparison is what I mean. It's not, it's not as super easy as compared to other bridges. But yeah, always never be afraid to block a Floyd Rose. There's lots of great tools and, and you can make, a, you know, you can, I did, when I did the video on how to basically block a Floyd Rose, I did the three types. You can use some pennies, because if you're broke, uh, or you know, coins, you can use a trimble note or you can use a piece of wood. I usually use a piece of wood if I block my Floyds, and I've said this before, I only have about one, maybe one, of all my Floyds are blocked. Because if I have a guitar with a Floyd, it's because I don't want it blocked. You know what I mean? I, I want a Floyd, like these two guitars behind me. I wanted a, this is a hardtail, and that's a Floyd. So I want them to be different when I play them and how the bridges feel. But if I had less guitars or if I want a Floyd and I didn't want to, you know, worry about all the time, you could block it. Super easy thing to, to deal with. Magic Man said, Floyd Rose, uh, he goes, uh, he likes them, but they're a pain, but they're worth it. Yeah, Floyds are one of those things that there's a lot of, you know, kind of products like this where it takes a small investment of time at the, at the beginning of everything. So restringing Floyd takes a longer than a standard, like a string through body bridge like this, but it's going to stay in tune more than this bridge and it's going to take more abuse and you can do all kinds of cool whammy tricks with it. So, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to, let's see, what are we doing? Um, looking at our subjects. What time is it? We still can go. I want to go a little longer before I do the cool unveiling thing I'm going to unveil. So let's go through some more questions. This is from David who says, are Warmoth strats good? Um, okay. Since you put a question mark there, I'll start there. Uh, Warmoth parts are good. I like their necks. I like their bodies. Um, of course, like anything, they get more and more expensive. Um, so, I mean, it's it's something that I, I like them. If That's my go-to parts company for bodies and necks if I want high-end stuff. I think their stuff is definitely as, as good as, like, let me put it this way. I think Warmoth is making guitar bodies and necks as good as Kiesel is making guitars and necks, as Sir is making guitars and necks, um, as, you know what I mean, as uh, Friedman guitars are making guitars and necks. I mean, they're definitely of that caliber on the way that they're made. They may not be fit and finished, and they don't have all the styles, but quality-wise, you're getting a good quality guitar. But I mean, the difference though is is that Sir Kiesel and Friedman are finishing those guitars, so that's why those guitars may end up just a little nicer than what Warmoth puts out. But I think it's raw parts. I think Warmoth is making good uh, raw parts, which is why Warmoth has been an OEM for certain companies over the years, making their parts. I mean, people bought expensive guitars with Warmoth parts. I mean, it's very common in this industry. Um, uh, so the part, next part of your question is thinking of a baritone neck and using a Gibson custom shop P90s. I like baritones and P90s. I'm not a big baritone person as I don't own a baritone, but when I play baritones, I would definitely, if I was going to own a baritone, it'd probably be with P90s for sure. The mid range punch of the P90s and the baritone would kind of come together nicely. Uh, it's a good combo. Yeah, absolutely. What bridge do you recommend? Uh, well, it's a baritone. I do a hardtail bridge. <laughs> I wouldn't do a tremolo. Uh, I'm not big into the tremolo baritones. Um, and then he basically said, thing, he's thanking me for the entertainment. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, Jack T says, my Reverend G20 makes loudish popping noise when switching from 20 watts to 4 watt, mo watt mode. Uh, what could cause this? I love the channel. Listen to every podcast. So I'm not super familiar with that amp, but so let me tell you what, I'm what I am familiar with is obviously these, these switches when they switch down to uh, up and down and it's not I don't know how loud the popping ish noise is so I would say a loud pop would be a problem you know if it's like gunk you know what I mean it was just huge and it was louder than the actual volume of the amp that you're playing at that might be something to be aware of 
Um, but it is not uncommon for amps to have a kind of a, a slight, a slight kind of pop when you're doing things. Cause basically you're putting something in line, you're putting some kind of resistance in line to, to cut it from 20 Watts to four Watts. And that's why I say it's tricky. Cause I don't know that amp. So I don't know which way they're doing it. There's a couple of different ways to get to the same place when it comes to dropping the wattage of an amplifier. Sometimes, you know, with the attenuators, there's different ways to do that. But, um, but what would be really nice is everybody out there that has, cause I know a lot of you guys have the Reverend G20, uh, amp if any of you could chime in like yes no if that's something he should be concerned with maybe he should be taking it somewhere to have it looked at that would be nice like i said downfall is i can only tell you it doesn't sound like a huge problem but it i also am not familiar with that exact amp uh tim says happy friday <laughs> friday happy friday phil happy friday he says ha, keep uh, doing what you're doing i i am i'm doing it right now with you we're doing it <laughs> we're having a happy friday Okay, I got to do it. I got to do the segue. So um, as you guys know, uh, I get stuff sometimes sent to me by by fans. And I try to feature some of it on the show, not too much of it. And I know some of you guys send me stuff and some stuff I don't feature and some stuff I do. And it's usually what I feature is uh, it usually is because it's either too extreme and I got to share it. Or in most cases, I think maybe you find it interesting. So this happened and this is something that happened with a viewer uh, who reached out and talked to my wife and they uh, hatched this uh, plan. Now, what's cool is that viewer might be watching now. So what's great about this is I'm going to tell you something and then they're going to discover what I'm, it is with you guys. So right now, thousands of people watching, here's what I want to tell you. I am a massively huge a Bruce Campbell fan. I have talked about this uh, many times on the show. Bruce Campbell is an actor. He was obviously in the Army in Darkness, Evil Dead 1 and 2. Uh, 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 why am I having a trouble now? <laughs> he was in, he was in, uh, obviously he was in Burn Notice, right? Uh, he was uh, Coach Bur Boomer, if you're into Disney, right? Um, uh, so anyways, somebody I really, really admire, somebody I really like. I like him for his, he does QAs. I took a lot of cues from him over the years watching him do all these QAs before I started doing my QAs. Hey, Matt Harrison said groovy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's what happened. Uh, this viewer that watches the live show, watches the podcast, um, I guess heard me talking about that I'm a huge Bruce Campbell fan and that I'm a huge Army of Darkness fan. And he reached out, talked to my wife. They orchestrated what I'm about to share with you. And I got a letter from him. And I'm not going to read the letter entirely like I always do. I want to kind of just go to the point of it. Um, so his name is uh, John Mesa. And his brother is William Mesa. And they worked on Army of Darkness. They worked on the movie Army of Darkness. Um, the, uh, the I'm trying not to. This is going to be crazy. Uh, cause I just, it's crazy. So basically he, uh, he and his brother did special effects on the movie army of darkness. And he's a, a, a fan of the show. And so what happened was through him and uh, orchestrating this with my wife, he sent me this amazing letter, which is very kind. And it talks about how he's a fan of the show and how he, him and his brother, William worked on the army darkness movie. And he wanted to send me a gift. And so what he did is he sent me some photos. Now I'm going to show you the photos. And then what I did is, uh, I'm going to share. So hold on. So he sent me some photos. Here's him and some of the awards. And these are the actual skeletons from the movie, the miniatures. See, I think he did this for scale. Now, before I go on to the other photos, uh, I did this, ah, uh, look at that. So here are photos that he actually took, him and his brother took, that's him and, and his brother, see, uh, at the castle, they built the castle. They signed this picture for me, as you can see right there in the corner, see there's the signatures. Uh, they signed the picture for me. These are actual photos uh, that they took of uh, while they're working the movie. And there, there's, there's the book. I have the book on audio. I have it on, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> I don't know what you call it. I, I, I'm so old. I'm gonna like, books on tape. I don't. It's not books on tape. I have it on. Uh, uh, it's right here on my phone. Audible. So I have uh, if Chen's can kill on Audible, but he sent me an actual copy of the book signed by Bruce Campbell, that says Groovy on it. So that's pretty, pretty freaking crazy. However, 
Then he sent me this, and this is an actual graystone miniature prop. I'm going to share it to you with you, the picture. Here it is. This is from the movie. If you guys saw the graveyard, you guys understand when I was showing you the pictures. Let me go back. That they did. This is the gravestone I'm showing you. That's what it looks like close up. This is from the cemetery when they had the miniature. Because remember, they did it through uh, through miniatures back then. This is predates special effects, CGI computers, right? So when they had the, and it'll come back around in a second. When you see the skeletons, the miniature skeletons right there, uh, when they're all fighting and they use miniatures, they they used miniatures like the castle. This gravestone. This is an actual miniature from the movie and very detailed by the way that's why i took a really good picture of it uh so it's an actual piece of the movie he put me a little card with it like i said i have to turn it this way to read it it says uh this was used in the stop motion miniature this is a gravestone from the stop motion miniature part of the movie army of darkness was one of the most uh fun films i ever worked on uh john mesa and uh so uh, I don't know how, first, I don't know how to explain the world that we live in now, that how something like that can happen, so big can be so small. Like, how does it, I'm in this huge fan of Army and Darkness, I have a guitar podcast, and then the guy who works on that movie, he literally watches the podcast, and then he's like, I want to send you something. So I told my wife, I go, we got to do something. And she says, okay, so I'm going to show you. This is what he doesn't know about. So she made him a, a shirt, because, you know, that's my thing. I like like having custom little things. Look at this. So John hasn't seen it because I know because uh, it's not been shipped out to him yet, but I want to show you. Look at that. She made him a New Year Gear shirt that says Groovy, and she put the chainsaw on the hand uh, for him. And then I'm going to actually swag him up with some other cool stuff. Um, uh, so, uh, so he, you know, to say thank you back, John. So watching the show, if John's watching right now, or if he watches the replay, uh, he he will um he will uh he will get a swag bag back uh so i'll give him some cool stuff i'll give him i don't have anything cool as what he gave me i'd like to like hey here's an actual piece of a guitar knob using this video <laughs> it won't be as cool but i promise uh you know the shirt will be custom made uh and and uh the uh, I'll swag them up with some cool stuff that I use, you know, like I do with you guys. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. I, I Like I said, I, I don't know how many of you would be excited about it, but I'm pretty freaking stoked about it. And it was really great timing. Uh, again, uh, it's always great when things line up perfectly. Like I told you, I've been dealing with the fact that my daughter, you know, we're like, oh, we got to take her somewhere and do something. And my wife's foot's broken. I broke my toe, by the way, which is only only somewhat hilarious. Uh, is I broke. Now, I've only broke two bones in my entire life. Uh, and both are my pinky toes. And I've now broke each one at some point in my life, uh, doing it this way we all do it. I was walking around the corner in the kitchen, and I just caught the thing. I broke my toe like two weeks ago. So I'm sitting there. So it's been a crazy couple of weeks getting work done, getting this stuff done. So um, there you go. I thought I'd share that with you guys. Thank you, John. And thank you to your brother for making uh, an amazing movie. I'm a huge, like I said, huge fan of Bruce Campbell, of those movies. Um, this is uh, pretty badass. Thank you, man. Uh, so I thought I'd share. There you go. I'm sharing with you guys uh, that. So, <laughs> yeah, Daryl says, Army of Darkness, KYG shirt. You know what's funny was, like, I uh, I, I, I go, yeah, this, this. She, she basically told me, she's like, yeah, when I was talking to him, she's like, I, I figured I'd do something special for him. And I was like, okay, cool. And she's like, she goes, so I thought maybe we'd do a chainsaw shirt. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> By the way, John, so if you're watching this, I begged her for one for me too. <laughs> but I'll get mine after yours, is what she told me. That's all right. So... <laughs> All right. Uh, um, all right. Uh, there you go. There, I'm just, Jesus, that was just cool, man. All right. And also, I uh, hope, like I said, hope you guys realize again, think about how cool this is. The guys who make special effects for a movie play freaking guitar. See, we're everywhere. We're musicians are everywhere. And uh, we do everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to guitar stuff. Cause that's what, uh, what we do here, I guess. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's start off with somewhere I left off. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to leave off. Uh, I'm going to start off with ER Webster. What's up? ER. He says, uh, there is a guitar that I am totally not going to buy, even though 
I've been checking it out two or three times per day. Thoughts on Simi Hollow Ibanez? <laughs> um, yeah, I really like Simi Hollow Ibanez. Look, I've, I've been very clear about the Simi Hollows. For me, I'm a big fan of the Simi Hollow Ibanezes and Epiphones. Uh, they're really cool guitars. I like them. I think they f they feel good. They they have good fit and finish. Um, the uh, you know, and especially semi hollows, because there's, you know, the only thing's really mod on them. Maybe upgrade the tuning keys, maybe the pickups and the electronics, which are easy but a pain in the butt. I say easy because it's not really complicated. It just takes a long time. Fishing stuff out and fishing it back through. Uh, if you want to upgrade that stuff. But no, I I, I think that's a, an easy way to go. What I will tell you is, um, like I just recently, obviously I just did the uh, uh, D'Angelico uh, semi hollow review. Obviously, I did the Firefly Simi Hollow review. Um, there's another Simi Hollow review coming very soon, which is Sire. I pushed that back because there's no Sires in stock. So you'd be like, hey, check this out. You can't get one. Uh, and uh, what I will tell you is uh, reviewing them, working on them, playing them over the years is Simi Hollows. And I didn't say this in the Firefly video. And I don't know why. I kind of talked about, somebody said, you talked about you liking the Epiphone more. Why? Um, and it's because I really wanted to focus on the fact that the, Sire, uh, the Firefly was an affordable price point. But what I will tell you, with the Simi Hollow guitar especially, every penny you spend, you are going to be buying something that's tangible um, because of the fact that those guitars like... So I'm not telling you you have to buy a nice one or expensive one. What I'm saying is every penny spent seems to net a good result. Um, and I'm sure there's a point... Don't get, get carried away. I'm sure there's a point where it doesn't pay a dividend. But what I'm telling you is when I play, when I play a $6,000 Simi Hollow guitar... I'm not saying it's great. What I'm saying is I pick up a guitar that I feel like is exponentially better than the $3,000 one, who's exponentially better than the $1,000 one, who's exponentially better than the $500 one. There seems to be a consistency there. And what I see when it comes to fit and finish time, because the fact that semi hollow guitars, like acoustic guitars, have so much hand time on them that the the more hand time on them, more time spent on them doing stuff, uh, will will pay a dividend. So I think the uh, Ivan is are a great way to go. I used, <coughs> excuse me, I used to be a huge Washburn Simi Hollow fan, but I, they don't make that many anymore, and I don't see them. But those are other ones I like very, very much. I should say. I just said excuse me, even though I I muted when I uh, cleared my throat. Sorry about that. Um, Clown, clown, why do we say clown? It's clan of house cats. Got a Gibson slash appetite from Sweetwater. After I set it up, truss rod feels maxed out after having the next straight arm stains. I don't know what that means. Arm stains. Let's go back. Diodario 10 to 52. So let's get, he's saying, after he set it up, the truss rod feels maxed after having the next straight. Okay. But is that a problem? Like, I understand the concern if I've seen that an issue with guitars before where people are like, hey, the guitar plays great, but I'm actually at the end of the tolerances of what I need. So, for instance, like, I've seen people be concerned with, like, okay, the action's fine and I love it, but the bridge is all the way down and it can't go any lower. And so the concern is that if something happens in the future, I don't have any, I don't have any wiggle room. <laughs> I don't have any wiggle room to kind of mess with that stuff. Uh, so uh, that always is a fear. And what I would tell you is if it's a high-end guitar like that and you kind of feel like, okay, it plays great, but yeah, if something goes wrong, uh, I have an issue, you may want to deal with that issue now. In other words, you may want to reach out to Sweetwater and 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 see about swapping it out for another one on an expensive guitar like that. Because again, if something does happen, look, I, I, you know, I would definitely vet it out fully before being kept with it because you will be the problem. You'll be the person taking the brunt of that financial issue later if it is an issue um and that goes for anybody if you buy an instrument uh this is really a concern sometimes with acoustics right um you, you know you you the you have to sand the the uh the saddle down on the bridge and by the time the action's right you know you've, you've killed all the material that makes you a little nervous and i understand that so yeah like i said definitely vet it out um it guitar should have a little bit of a ability to go you know, back up a little bit, back down a little bit. You don't want anything ever maxed out. Same with the truss rod. If your neck's bone straight, but your truss rod is so as tight as it can get, it's a little concerning. Like I said, I don't want to give that too much concern because sometimes it's not the end of the world, but it does it does lead you to want to be cautious about that. Uh, Greg says, hey, a tip for no reason. What? 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, said, I did see you're over 319,000 subs now, maybe 400,000 by the time next year. Let's see. Uh, by next year, 400,000. Nope, that wouldn't happen. Uh, my max on my channel, I am, I am a, and I don't want to jinx it, but I want to tell you, I am a consistent machine on YouTube. I have been since the day, and I'll tell you why I think that is, especially again, whenever this comes up. Um, what I mean by that is I hit a million views one month on YouTube. And then every month after that, I've always hit a million. I have like one month where I, I, I was in the high 900,000 range. Um, actually it's not true because that month I deleted some videos out. <laughs> so it just k killed the numbers a little bit, but, uh, I do a million views. Like if I, sometimes I'll do a one and a half million. Sometimes I do 1.6. Sometimes I'm 1.2 or one, you know, 1.2. I've been 2 million views in a month, but man, every month, million views. If you look at my total v views for videos on channel subscribers, same thing, man. My subscriber rate is a, just a consistent machine of like this number. I, I very rarely peak. Uh, up and I very rarely dip super down, even though some channels do, they, they drop a lot and then they, they get a lot and especially they get a lot. Um, and here's why, and I, why I think that is on this channel, why my numbers are consistent because I watch other channels too, like a lot of you guys do. And I can tell you, cause I look at their metrics like mine and you can see that they swing much differently than, than mine kind of stays this way for years. Like I said, it's like, bam, like, look, I, the, and I, and that I shouldn't say that cause I say I'm slowly moving up because overall, like I said, my average views, uh, three years ago, just go off three years metrics. Three years ago, I was averaging 20,000 views per video. You guys don't think that cause you guys see a video go, Oh, we got a half a million or half a million views or this video got a hundred thousand views and this video got 5,000 views. Yeah. That's what happens. You're all over the place based on your subject time of year, how much videos you're pumping on the channel. Um, but average view video is 20,000 views for me was like that for years. Now it's averages about three, three, 30,000 views per video. So I'm up about 10,000 views per video on average. I believe that's because of COVID more people w watching, uh, content at home. So I don't think that's going to stay with me forever. Um, I think I'll go slowly back down to the 25, 20,000 views per video. What I will tell you is like I said, consistency in my views, consistency in my subscriptions, uh, which has always been moderately you know, stable. Like I said, I don't want to say, cause it's not great. My subscription rate is not great, but it's not low either. It's just consistent. Here's why I think it's consistent. Um, cause I believe in a different, I have a different philosophy than some channels for sure. And I mean, some channels, I don't mean big channels. I mean, all channels on YouTube, some channels focus on new viewership. I focus on my current viewership. It's, it's not a new strategy. It's not my strategy. I didn't invent it. It's been used by successful bands all around the world to say some bands care about making an album that's going to break into a new audience. And some bands think, how can we make the current fans even more excited about what we do? Maybe we need a behind the scenes video. Maybe we need, uh, you know, a, 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 uh, not a greatest hits, but a greatest hits album, you know, done differently for the fans. So I, if you notice with my video content, even my giveaways are really kind of focused on you guys more so than like, Hey, if you're new to my channel, you're going to win a guitar. It's really not the focus there. The focus is, uh, to reward the current base. You know, it's why sometimes I don't even announce things. You know what I mean? I just do them. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's, uh, been my focus. Uh, same thing with this show every week. It's how do I get the people that show up every week to keep coming every week and hold this audience, this size. A lot of you guys notice there's 1,055 of you. That's a common number for this channel on a live show. We'll get a low, a low week will be 800 for us and a high week will be 1100. We stay in that range. We don't really peak up too much, you know, right? Um, that's why I'm not looking for anything too crazy out there. Just stay focused on what, what I have here and make sure the people that here are, are happy. Uh, and so there you go. Um, so, okay. So there you go. <laughs> I think that was the core. I think that answered the non question. He didn't even have a question and he got that information. Uh, so we have, uh, so I, that's what I was going to say. I should end this. I try to end everything with a, something that can, you can take away from this. If you're a YouTube channel, I would definitely focus on that. I have found great success with that. That's my success. I would love to tell you, uh, you know, how to be the next, uh, you know, Tyler Larson or the next, you know, whoever's getting, you know, millions and millions, you know, Rick Beato. And besides being great channels, that helps, uh, you know, 
But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, I heard, I've hung out many times with Marty Schwartz and his manager, Michael, and I consider them good friends. And, um, you know, he's 3 million subscribers and he knows how to grow a channel. Let me just tell you. And I've took a little bit of that information and I kind of used it a little bit, but then I realized like, that's not me. That's him. He can grow a channel. That's his focus. I, I want to do, you know, like I said, I want to build my community uh, and hold it. And so um, what I will tell you is if you're a channel, I would focus on that. Everybody seems to focus like, how do I get to 10,000 subscribers? I'm like, I don't know. How about this? Why don't you worry how to be a successful channel with 2,000 subscribers? And then it won't matter because 10,000 will be successful, right? I tell everybody this is swear to God truth. I was successful. And as far as I'm concerned on this channel at 30,000 subscribers, at 30,000 subscribers, I was making some kind of money on YouTube. Things were kind of happening the success was there. The only success that wasn't there is maybe companies weren't sending free gear, but that wasn't really a goal for me at that point. Um, I already had nice gear. In fact, n gear now for me is about churning it. That's why we're doing the giveaways. I'm like, what are we gonna do with these guitars? Let's give them away. All right, <sighs> I hope that helps. Bradley says, oh no, I skipped somebody. But I'll do Bradley and then I'll go back. Uh, Bradley says, hey, got a good deal on some pedals at Sweetwater. Asked if they could give me a deal on any. Saved 100 bucks. Only spent 700 bucks. Uh, my wife is pissed. I'm assuming it's pissed. <laughs> but it's all good. Thanks for all. <laughs> he goes, thanks for everything you do. Have, your wife's going to be more pissed now. <laughs> you understand that, Bradley, right? You, you, I hope your wife's not in the room because I don't want her to hear this. Uh, uh, but she's like, hey, what did you do? I spent $700 on pedals. What the F? Oh, and I gave a YouTuber 20 bucks. <laughs> I hope this wasn't a super chat, just a spider. It's like, you think you're pissed about $700 in useless pedals. Here's $20 going to a useless YouTube channel. I'm just kidding. I hope I'm not useless. Uh, but yes, I will have a beer on you. Uh, so, you know, I, I, uh, did not, I said last weekend, I think I said I was going to have a drink and a good time. And like I said, we went to the thing. Uh, what happened was my sinuses went crazy. I don't know what that was. I don't know what I did. I feel like all of a sudden I've never, ha I never said never. I've had it happen about a couple years ago where my sinuses went nuts, where you just have that sinus head where your head hurts and you can feel all this pressure right there and you take the Sudafed or whatever you take and nothing's working. And man, when you feel like that, just that, you know, it doesn't feel good to drink. Um, uh, so back to, back to Rick, Rick says, have you ever reviewed planet tone pickups? I have not. Uh, there are a few pickups out there that obviously I haven't reviewed or checked out. Uh, but, uh, I hear good things. You guys, you guys always are sending cool about sending me cool new pickups and stuff. And, and we, we talked about doing more, uh, pickup, uh, videos. And, uh, I've been kind of off them a little while lately. Uh, cause that's what happens. You go through trends. I tried it has nothing to do with, uh, look, it has nothing to do with companies sending stuff out or money, stuff like that it has usually to do with like fun factor. You know what I mean? It's hard. It's hard getting up the energy sometimes when I'm making these videos, like, okay, what do I want to talk about? What am I excited about? If I'm excited, I can kind of chug through an hour of talking in a video much easier than if I'm like, you know, <laughs> Like, what are we going to talk about? What's new and exciting? Pickups are a little difficult to get excited about all the time, just like guitars and pedals. So uh, maybe I'll go back. Now, like I said, well, I like it when you guys poke at me a little bit like this. Like, hey, what do you guys, what do you think of this? Now I know to go back and check that out. Voodoo Fist says, hey, Phil, are you going to be reviewing one of those Gibson Tony Iommi SGs? I am not. Uh, it says with P90s in the near future. I have no no plans. Um, it says I want to buy one from Sweetwater, but it would be cool to see if you review one first. Well, you never know. They might send something out. Uh, like I said, right now, I, know, I just want to be clear. I don't know this to be true, okay, what I'm about to tell you, Voodoo Fist, but I would be, I feel pretty pretty confident in what I'm about to say. Obviously, uh, the, the, the peeps at Sweetwater have been listening to the podcast. This is very evident as they've reached out <laughs> a lot of Mondays now and said, hey, your audience was talking about this. Let's get this shipped out. They've done that. I don't think they have any plans in the near future to stop doing that. So that's great. However, they just shipped me a bunch of stuff. And I, so I have to, I, so what I would guess is um, I would say at least for the next two weeks, they're not going to probably listen to anything you guys suggest and send anything. They might. I could be wrong. I'd be listening right now and be like, what is Phil talking about? We're totally going to send out a Tony Iommi's SG to get that on the channel and maybe do a giveaway or do something. Um, but uh, I got to get through what they sent out because <laughs> it just showed up like Thursday of this week. Uh, so there'll be some videos of stuff, including the Vela versus Vela video. Grumpy Mike Guitar. What's up, Grumpy Mike? 
Grumpy Mike Guitar says, what does he want to know? He says, I, oh, I want to wish my daughter a 17, a happy belated 17th birthday. Uh, and uh, I hope she enjoyed the show. She, she absolutely loved the show. She was in hysterics the entire show. She's a huge John Mulaney fan. Uh, my, my daughter's favorite part of the show uh, was if you're not a John Mulaney fan, if you guys don't know John Mulaney, he's a stand-up comic. Obviously, he's got a bunch of specials on on Netflix right now, and he's really big with the teenage girl community, <laughs> and that I'm aware of. And so I think he's hilarious too. But what's funny is during his stand-up, he was talking about meeting somebody's uh, a, a, a middle-aged man and talking to him, and they said, uh, "Are you a comedian?" And he's like, "Yeah," and he says, "I've never heard of you." And he goes, "Yeah, ask your daughter." <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter's died hysterics because obviously we were there that night because of her. So the girls laughed a little harder in the audience than, than you know, everybody else. But it was still very good. Very good show. I, it was one of my favorite stand-up shows. And uh, I've seen I've seen a lot of stand-up shows. I've gone to as many stand-up comedians as rock bands for sure. Um, my favorite stand-up show that you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you anyways. My favorite stand-up show, uh, it was uh, George Carlin. Uh, but and, and and to be fair, it's one of those things that will never get topped. Not because he's the greatest, even though he is the goat. Man, he's the greatest of all times, as far as I'm concerned. Um, like I said, I saw him literally before shipping out to Meps. Uh, <laughs> my my mom and her friend took me to Buddy's Grill. It's just a restaurant that was in Tucson. I don't think it's there anymore. And we had oysters, Rockefeller, and chicken Sonoma. See how crazy this is? Like I I don't even know how I can remember all this crap. Uh, chicken Sonoma, ro oysters, Rockefeller, and then we went and saw George Carlin uh, live. And then you know obviously. And then uh, the next morning I had to get up and they took me to Meps in Phoenix uh, to to go to the army. So uh, that is a. Uh, you know, it's an unbeatable moment. <laughs> Just I hate to say it. Great, com you see the you see the goat of all comedians, and then literally, you know, before a life changing event like you know, obviously being screamed at and spit in the face the next couple of days. Well, not a couple of days, but in a couple of days, kind of sticks in your head. <laughs> Plus, that food was really good. It was it was really nice to have like a, a that meal, you know, for the for right before <laughs> basic. B side studio said. Hey, Phil, I got an Iron Ball SE, a Vox AC-15 with cream back and a Mesa DC-3. Okay, I'll have great cleans. Gear pressure is telling me I need a Fender Deluxe. Do I really? <laughs> or is it close enough and good enough? Um, look, I, I know the rule in the show. If you think you need it, you should buy it kind of thing. But in re re retrospect, I want to kind of hit you on this. Um, I have... Uh, I don't have all those amps, but I've played all those amps. I currently have the Iron Ball SE and the uh, Deluxe Reverb. Look, the Deluxe is its own thing, man. That's what sucks. You have three great clean amps. I, I don't want you, I, I don't want to tell you you have to buy another amp. Another amp's tough because more amps is more real estate. They're not like guitars. I mean, two, you know, you can put two guitars in the same space as one amp, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know what I mean? Get to, and you can hang them on the wall and you can't hang the amps. Amps take up real estate. They're a little harder for, you know, to have as a purchase in the home for sure and justify. Me personally, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, look, the AC-15 is a fantastic amp. I, I don't think you should want for anything from the clean channel on that. The Iron Ball's got a great clean channel. The DC-3 is great clean channel, but the 65 Deluxe is an, it's its own unique. Uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful tone. It's a, so do you need it? No, absolutely you don't need it. But will it be different than those amps and will it give you something unique? Yes. Will you be missing out? No. The only thing to think about is that's really all the Deluxe is going to bring to the party is this one beautiful, luscious, clean, and beautiful reverb. I can tell you right now, none of those amps that you have have the reverb tank that the Deluxe has. The AC-15 uh, reverb tank is shallow, uh, shorter, I should say. It's, 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 so it's a different splash and the tremolo effect on the uh, Deluxe. The Deluxe is its own thing. So, And that's why I say that. I really hate sending you down the road of buying a $1,500 amp. I hope you find a deal on one. But I will tell you this, uh, out of those four amps, and I really like the Iron Ball SE, if you told me out of the four amps you just mentioned I could only keep one, I would keep my Deluxe Reverb. And I'd stick the Fireball pedal in front of it, <laughs> something to get that tone. Uh, Keith says, uh, thank you for your service uh, to the guitar nerd community. You're welcome. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, you know, somebody was mentioning we should get Know Your Gear like challenge coins, and I was like, oh, that sounds such a good and bad idea that I love it. 
but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but I'm like, maybe we need that. And then I was like, is, who's going to carry around these, you know, I don't know how heavy a challenge coin is. They're pretty heavy, man, if you have them in your pocket. So, uh, like, a you know, you, and then I was like, what do I do? Do I do a challenge coin, just put the New Year logo on it? Do I get one of, like, a, the three-dimensional ones? Um, so... That's that's guitar nerd right there. If you have a Know Your Gear challenge coin, that would make you the nerdiest person in the room, I would imagine. <laughs> For sure. Uh, Thunder Falcon says, oh, we already said uh, what he said. He wanted us to light up the bad cats, and we already talked about that. Peter wants us to know. What does Peter says? Good afternoon, Philip. Weird question. Uh, I buy, maintain, and fix upgrade guitars, okay? But I rarely play them anymore. What's the hell wrong with me? Love you, man. Nothing is wrong with you. I have actually seen this. This is not um, it's not an uncommon thing to be told uh, that I've heard. It has nothing to do with YouTube. But at the store, it would it, with this, you know, people would just like, I like to fix them up or I like to own them and stare at them. Sure, why not? I, I Look, guitars are more than just musical instruments. They're more than tools. They are those things. And that should be their primary use, obviously. We want you to make music with them. Um, there's no doubt. There is, uh, there is only upsides when it comes to creating music, right? Music will change your life. It, it's literally, uh, it will, it, it will improve your personality, improve your, your, uh, your, I don't want to say aura. <laughs> I don't know if I'm not ready for that, but maybe it does. Uh, it improves your, um, your sensibilities, you know, who you are, your health. It's, it's music is just everything to me. So an instrument making music is the, you know, it's the greatest thing I can think of happening. And the, I, and the idea of a musical instrument not making music d doesn't bring me as much joy. That's for sure. But I understand the concept of, Hey, I just fixed them up or Hey, I just stare at them because they are art and they are just things to do. Look, uh, sometimes to me, uh, here's why I'm saying this. And I, I want to walk you down this thought process with me. So, uh, you know, I, I've had different hobbies before guitar. One of my things I did before, before I discovered guitar as a, as a young teenager, um, I was building model airplanes to the level where like my friend and I, we would enter into the state fair we didn't, we didn't win, but we would get honorable mentions, like making, I once made like a diorama of an A-10 warthog, like on the entire flight line, like with, you know, everything, right? And I even simulated the the engines, like the, I've made pieces, I made little microscopic uh, to scale newspapers stuck on the fence line, you know, like the plane was tossing up trash against the fence line and stuff. And I would do stuff like that. Uh, and airbrush, that's where I learned to airbrush. Like I said, I don't paint and I don't refinish guitars, but I'm proficient with an airbrush because uh, I've always had my Pache air, airbrush, you know, when I do my F F-16s, F-18s, A-10s. Um, and um, my point to this is, is that building a replica of an airplane or a car to me, I don't see it far-fetched from taking a guitar and fixing it up and doing all this stuff, you know, right? And then just staring at it. Sure, why not? Why not? So no no, uh, no harm in that, um, you know. Uh, but I would suggest always, if you have those skills, if you're refining those skills of fixing up guitars, make sure you're doing a service for the community by maybe fixing up people's guitars. Plus, you can make a little money, right? You make a little money, they get an improved instrument. So I'm not saying you should be a full-time repair tech or anything, but... You know, you can always build in that into your your friendship circles. Like, hey, I fix up guitars, and you might be doing that. I just in case, I'm just suggesting it to you. Okay, hold on. Patient Zero says, Phil, I just ordered an American Pro Two Stratocaster, uh, Dark Knight. It's a cool color. I always wanted a Strat Plus in that color. I don't think they called it the same color, but it looked kind of the same. Uh, it says, have you played these yet? I have played one. By the way, miss the store and chat and gear. Yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of the good bad things uh, when I bump into local fr uh, local friends and customers and viewers is they'll go, uh, oh, I love the channel, thanks, but I miss man, miss the store. I'm like, yeah, I understand. But some of them say and they follow up with this a lot, which makes me feel good. And so if you're just saying that to make me feel good, keep doing it because it works. Uh, they'll say, oh, I really miss you know going to the store and talking guitar with you. And I go, oh yeah. And they go, but it's like virtually I get to do it now on YouTube. And I'm like, yeah. Because this is literally how the store was every day. You would walk in. You th This podcast that you're watching, this is how I would be in my store every day. And you would just walk into this. You would just walk in the store and all of us would be talking guitar. Um, if we weren't working, like, you know, well, we were always working. But you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't want to be like, we never worked, really. Uh, it says, by the way, missed the store. Okay, we talked about it. By the way, uh, Jackson Graveyard, uh, Randy Rhodes V is still kicking butt. Who am I? Oh my 
goodness. I know who this is. This is Jason. Am I right? Randy Rhodes reverse re, re graveyard. I think I'm right. I think I'm right. I hope I'm right. If I'm not right, I'm sure I'll find out. But I think I'm right. Um, Craig, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. <laughs> I think I'm right. Uh, Craig says, uh, "Are old Mesa combos like the Studio Twenty Two Subway Rocket and Satellite a good buy, or better to buy a sixty five oh five mini head or a one twelve for rock and metal?" Okay, um, they're different amplifiers. Look, just because the the Studio Twenty Two, the Subway uh, Rocket, the Satellite, they are Mesas, but they're not that sound of the 6505. So what I'm and, and and what I mean by that is they're not like the Mark V sound. They're not the uh, rectoverb sound. They're a sound that's close to that, but they're not that sound. So they're not going to be the same. Quality wise, I would prefer them way over the 6505 mini head and I have no reasons to really kind of dog the 6505 mini head. It's a it's a great head uh for the price point and of course as you know, I'm a fan of the 5150 which is the 6505 is the same thing. Um they're different. They also shouldn't be in the same price points but i could be totally wrong so if you're looking at the same price points me personally if i could buy a good strong well-built uh amplifier that you know uh, for the price point of a newer uh kind of you know newer amplifier that's not built as well i would pick that that's what i would personally pick so that's what i currently own is kind of more you know, if you notice, I don't buy a whole lot of inexpensive amplifiers. I've bought a few for the channel, and I don't really stick to them very often. Guitars, I really believe this. I think you can buy a $200 guitar. It kicks ass all day long. It, you know, definitely on par with anything out there. Um, amplifiers are a little different. The less expensive amplifiers are very good. But, and and so that's what I want to get to. It's not that they're not good, and then you got to get expensive amplifiers to get good. But when you get expensive amplifiers more expensive amplifiers, they really seem to do things that are really, really cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the distortions and, and the clean tones seem to flow a little better. Um, so that's just something to think about. That's just my opinion for whatever that's worth. And then uh, I, I want to say this is T T R T R T T R K T M Bell. I'm going to say Tinkerbell, right? It is Tinkerbell. Uh just did a super chat for no reason. Oh, and then did a super another super chat. It says Phil, I bought a Fender Lone Star Strat, new in 1997. Says uh, has the original strings, plastic on the pick guard, mint. Would it be worth a more? Would it be worth more original, or with a new setup? Huh. I I, I assume when you say new setup, I mean having the guitar set up. But are, are you mean like a newer s sets of electronics and tune? No, it's worth more original. Everything's always worth more original. No, there's almost no exceptions to that. That's just so that's the easy part of your question. A very easy question. Keep it original if you can. Unless, of course, uh, you know, it's a preference you want to use it, but I'm telling you for if you're cared about vo value, keep it original. David says, I bought a Line 6 FX, uh, HSX, 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 FX. What are your opinions on it moving? Oh. Why am I not having? Why am I having trouble reading this? Let's start this again, David. He said he just bought a Line Six, six HX Effects. What are your opinions on it? I'm loving it so far. Uh, I have one and I use it every day. <laughs> so I uh, every day it seems so. You know, I use it all the time. I, I usually have it right here. It's always right here, so I can use it uh, for for what I'm doing for. Uh, absolutely. Um, it, to me, still right now, for me, this is my favorite uh, effects unit, period. Uh, more than Axe Effects, more than um, the Cortex Quad, whatever, blah, blah, blah. More than the uh, Kempers, more than anything. But of course, also more than the Line 6 Helix stuff. Because this is the function for me. This is the size of a function. This does everything I need it to do. Uh, which is make basically, I, you know, I have three settings. I have three settings on this, and I don't even use one. I have a clean and a dirty, and that's what I use. I I modeled out two amplifiers. I have essentially like a plexi in here and a Fender clean, and uh, this does what I need to do. Unless, of course, I'm just using it for extra effects. I also use effects, so I actually swear by it, and I like it a lot. Um, I thought about trying the new. I thought about trying the new. Um, 
head rush stuff and you know and then i really like i sobered up so to speak and i was like okay i'm gonna do this and then i'm like why i already like the hx effects and i was like oh i like the touch screen i like the features you know but it was all like nah i'm not doing that <laughs> The reality, you know, because sometimes, like I said, because of YouTube, I go, oh, it'll be a great video. I'll explain, you know, I'll compare it and people will see a comparison. And then it would be a good video. But deep down, I'm happy. So I'm just going to, you know, if I thought it was something that was a really good video and I should do it. Otherwise, I'm just going to stick with what I like. Uh, he also, David, followed up with uh, uh, love you in the channel, by the way. Keep making awesome content. Dude, thank you for the compliments. They're always well taken. Uh, and, you know, thank you for them. Uh, Sean Brooks says, Phil, I've been having trouble with uh, with Updog. I don't know what Updog is. Can you help? Sean, I don't know what Updog is. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there you go. I don't know what that is. Uh, Juggernaut, I'm going to say Juggernaut TV2, the Juggernaut, says, Phil, uh, Fender Mexican... Makes great satin necks, yep. If you don't get satin, however, they seem to pour all the lacquer on the earth into the neck. Jimmy Page Dragon Telly is the worst. Uh, anyone like these? Uh, so, I, I, I think I, I think I know where you're going with this, uh, but I don't feel that way about the Made in Mexico stuff. I feel about all Fender stuff. Like, I like glossy necks. Like, I like my Gibson glossy necks, which are nitrocellulose. I like the uh, PRS ones, which are, you know, all kinds of finishes. Now they're nitro, but, you know, the other ones I had were, like, kind of more of a polyurethane. Um, I like the, um, obviously, the, the this is a finished neck on the back of this Kiesel, right? So, again, I like this finish on this. The Sinister Gates right here, the Schecter, is a gloss neck, and I like that as well. But Fender, all of my necks are basically uh, a satin-esque uh, finish. I don't know why. I just don't like Fender's gloss necks. I don't think I own a single. I'm looking, and I absolutely know for a fact I don't own a single Fender guitar with a glossy neck. And um, and deep down, I've, you guys have heard me say that I really believe that the Eric Johnson Stratocaster is one of the best buys you can buy. It's basically custom shop Fender for production pricing, even though it's not inexpensive, it's a lot more inexpensive than those. And that's the one thing that turns me off is the glossy neck. And I know if I bought one, I'd have to sand that neck. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, because if I decide I ever don't want the guitar, I just killed the value on it. So you know what I mean? So I, I just think about that going, I don't know. I, re I really know I want it. So in theory, app says, what model Magnetone amp were you uh, saying you almost bought? I have no idea. It, uh, I'm not familiar enough to know what the names are. It's just it was a combo amp with a tremolo in it. He says, I'm eyeing one basically on reverb. Uh, I just don't know. I don't know which one it was. Um, I looked. I mean, I, it's like I didn't look at the model number because the guy was like, yeah, you can't buy this. Uh, but when I looked on uh, Sweetwater, it looked like they all looked the same to me. So it looked like what that it was, whatever the 112 combo was. Uh, hello, Dr. Jekyll <laughs> says, uh, move to a new home, get buzz in my amp till I touch the strings. Okay. Start it after move happens multi with multiple guitars, amps, even plugged into the surge protector, direct outlet, tried multiple outlets. Remember, trying multiple outlets does not change it. You need to change breakers. You know what I mean? So you need to get off whatever breaker that is. So if that room, so if you change every outlet in that room, if you go to every outlet and they're on the same breaker, which is connected to another problem, that's going to be the problem. Uh, so you definitely want to take an extension cord and plug it into. And like I said, I've learned to test this in the bathrooms. Works really good. You could probably do it in the kitchen. It's wherever your GFI outlets are because the GFI outlets, you'll know, won't be connected to that room. That right. Usually your GFIs, and again, I'm not an electrician, so I'm not trying to give electrician advice, but a GFI outlet usually, like in my house, which is pretty typical, the garage, the patio outlets, pretty much all the outside outlets are on one GFI. And then I think, and they might be on all the same as the bathrooms in the kitchen, but they're all on GFI. That's it. And then everything else in the house is on everything else. Um, so that's what I would do. That's one way to isolate the problem to the actual house, right? In other words, if you switch to a GFI and, and it's still doing it, then you know that they're not connected to whatever was in that room. So you know that the problem is happening more than just what's in the house. That's what I would, uh, that's my suggest. That's my very uneducated electrician advice <laughs> to you. Um, 
Okay. Waterford Giant says, JR uh, did a demo of LPD Delay. Awesome, but already sold out. Hope there are more coming. Well, that's the downfall of, of YouTube reviews. Um, when I did the uh, Pedal Pal uh, pedal, they sold. I think they're sold out for the, the year. I, don't, I mean, it's bad. I saw where people are now selling Pedal Pal. Please don't buy them. And Luis and Alvaro, I think, will stand by me on, on this. Please don't pay the $600 asking price people are selling those pedals for. It's crazy. People are asking $600 for the pedals, uh, the Pedal Pal uh, pedals now. Um, you know, they'll catch up. <laughs> You know, like I said, all these all these builders will catch up. Uh, I think everybody's going to catch up real soon, uh, whether they realize it or not. One thing I get to do, and I try to kind of explain this when I'm having these uh, meetings with these companies, I do a lot of consulting with companies, um, and not just in this industry. And one of the things that happens with that is that obviously sign a lot of NDAs. I have a lot of NDA agreements about certain things, and one of the problems is that sometimes when a company's, you know, we're talking a particular problem, I'm like, wow, so is these, like, I ever, all these other five companies are having this exact same problem, but I can't share that with them all um, specifically. I can only give them general information. So back to this, let me tell you, um, I, I, I see, I'm seeing almost across the board most companies uh, in, in September and October, which is not no, not over yet, most companies are producing more product than orders. Now, here's what's important about that. They're still back order. So let me give you an example. Most companies are seeing numbers like uh, where they're basically getting more orders every month than what they can produce. And so they are back ordered and the back order continues to grow or not change because the orders have been coming in at the pace of the manufacturing. But what I saw in the last... I don't even say 60 days in the last 30 days for a fact in the last 30 days, consistently through all kinds of product lines, you are seeing that they are producing again more than they're getting orders. Now they're still back ordered, but that's the first break in the sign of, okay, we might be slowing down on orders. And then, then the discussion becomes about the fact that we don't have, they don't have product for Christmas. Keep in mind, a lot of that product issue is with toys and not a lot of with made guitar manufacturers and and guitar products. There is not a whole lot of manufacturers that are worried about not having any product. There's just a concern that there won't be a huge variety of product all the way up to Christmas. And you have to understand something, and this is where it gets a little confusing. And I want you to be very clear. The majority of consumers, especially guitar players, because that's what we're gonna discuss is guitar players, make a majority of the purchases like anybody else right before Christmas, okay? Um, what's the big misnomer? The big misnomer is that, uh, you know, Black Friday is like the record sales day of the year. It's not really. I think the record sales day of the year is either the either Christmas Eve <laughs> or it's usually the Saturday before Christmas or the weekend before Christmas. Now, the internet changes that a little bit because people can't get stuff fast enough Christmas. So it's about two weeks out from Christmas is the internet's peak, right? There's a peak of when you can guarantee by Christmas. So that's the... the Let's just say, to keep it easy, the cl closest possible date to Christmas that you can still get a delivery by Christmas is probably one of the peak days for the internet, okay? So in other words, most consumers are going to do most of the purchasing last minute. That is very consistent. It's been the way for years. It's never going to change. Uh, well, I don't know if it's never going to change. It's never changed. Maybe it will change, but it's never changed. So you have to understand the concern isn't that there isn't enough product to, to cover the consumers. The concern is that, that the people who are making last minute decisions on their purchases are probably not going to have the selection they're going to enjoy. I've seen a lot of retailers try to hype this into something that's not. First of all, without, and again, I could be wrong just like they can be wrong. So keep that in mind. They, you know, right. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. But if they're wrong, I'm sure they won't apologize. Um, but here's what I'm going to tell you. Well, consistency. Here's consistency. Consistency is used prices are following, 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 falling. That is consistent. You can go on Reverb right now. There are all kinds of products. This time last year, you couldn't even find the products, much less find them for the price that was pretty much at retail. Now you can find them and there's deals. Um, 
Very consistency. Look at something like a Bogner amp. Last year, this time, you couldn't even find the Bogner Ecstasy's amps. There was like one in stock on Reverb. Now there's probably three or four used ones at a at a price that's been lower than have seen. There's a lot of discounts. So, um, so, uh, so, anyways, the point is is that uh, used prices are coming down. So you can get better deals on used gear for sure. Um, you are also there is inventory. So. This idea that nobody's going to have guitars is not really likely. Will you get the color guitar you absolutely want? Yeah, that's where it's going to go dicey. Yeah, you know what I mean? The hot selling color of that guitar model might be the hardest one to find of the bunch. But that's always going to happen during the holidays. Um, and we know that there's supply chain issues. I'm very aware of that because I have supply chain issues. So we're all very, very, uh, very aware of the supply chain issues. However, that being said, like I said, you have to be prepared for the fact that there was this little dip just for a second. There's been a little dip right in the beginning of fourth quarter into third quarter when it comes to purchases. And that's actually going to help uh, a little bit of the manufacturers catch up a little bit. So like I said, the only thing I will tell you is this. Do not pay this dumb price on product. Find a deal. You can find deals or pay the right price. But also, if you think you're going to need it or want it that bad, yeah, I would definitely buy it ahead of time. But the retailer is kind of putting this whole like, if you don't buy it now, good luck. Eh, I'm not seeing that. And uh, I don't think any of you are either. You know what I mean? It's very rare, uh, this this idea. And, uh, you know, high-end stuff is different too, by the way. I keep hearing about like, oh, high-end stuff is getting back ordered, hell, you know, hell and back. Um and, uh, yeah, but they're also not producing a lot more of it. And, you know, <laughs> it was already started. Anyway, think of this cost fender custom shop's been a year to two year back order since 2000, like 11. That's been a back, you know, it's been in back order land. So it's been in back order forever. So the fact that it is a little bit more back ordered isn't really that big of a deal. Um, like, like it is when you can't find stuff at all. Um, I think I told you guys this story. I remember, uh, you know, uh, this summer, remember everybody was talking about, nah, it was earlier in the year, earlier this year, during still a bigger part of the boom of the sales. Remember everybody was like, oh, every retailer I talked to is like, you can't get SIRs. It's a six, six, six month. It was like, I don't know, two year waiting list to get a SIR. And I went looking at SIRs and I found a dealer with like 30 or 40 of them in stock. And they're like, oh, you can't even get them. And I'm like, well, you, you can. And then I, and then they gave me a smoking deal. And I was like, so, and I remember thinking like after I was done going, okay, I don't understand. You can't get them, but there they are. There's, and there's a deal. <laughs> Somebody's full of crap a little bit, a little bit. So I think there's a little bit of full of crap. There's some truth, but it's a little bit, it's like I said, it gets exaggerated like everything else. So I would say for when it comes to guitars, you know what I mean? If you need something specific, I would do it now. But if you're just like worried that there won't be any guitars for Christmas, that's just asininely crazy. There'll be lots of inventory, lots of stuff. So lots of guitars, lots of pedals. If all that's all you care about, certain things. But like I said, being specific, then I would worry about it. Uh, Uh, I'm not old on vintage, says my uh, my wait list for a Wildwood Edition Mythos Mil Milnier. I don't know how, I think that's how you say it, Milnier. Uh, was short, shorter than the Way Huge pedal. I'm guessing because the basically the Mythos was built in the U.S. and didn't have to go through a shipyard. Um, well, I'm, Way Huge is probably also, um, uh, well, it's also made in the USA, but I understand it might have more of a Chinese PC board, you know, coming from more parts from from overseas in China where the Mythos uh, stuff is made in Nashville by a smaller builder. And he's probably getting his stuff from all pedals or a smaller distributor. That's probably possible uh, also. But you have to also understand, too, what happens with the smaller builders, which you don't understand, is one of the things that's been very confusing. And Fender even does this, which is very confusing. They talk about orders, but not sales. Orders are a little tricky thing. So, for instance, we see it all the time. We see like, um, oh, we took in a thousand orders. Well, that's not a thousand sales until they're actually finished. So they're going to make a thousand pieces and then you go, oh, I want one. And they don't have one. 
And that's what's happening, by the way, that, that ties back into Pedal Pal. Pedal Pal, that's why I say don't pay $600, put yourself on a waiting list because what's happening with those guys is I talked to Luis just a couple weeks ago. You know, he's like, well, we'll get, we'll get, you know, I think they got like 500 orders. They got 500 orders for that pedal. And then they're like, okay, we're, we're, we're making them. And everybody's waiting, but then what happens is they they call you to ship, and then you're like, yeah, I've changed my mind. So they just go right to the next list, and then all of a sudden, that 500 orders turns into you know 420 orders off that pedal uh, in that in that run. So same thing with Mythos. He could have had, you know what I mean. He could have had uh, same with uh, Wildwood. They could have had orders. Maybe maybe they had I don't know 50 of those pedals ordered up, and they had. 51 customers, and then all of a sudden only 46 customers took it, and that's why you got yours faster. That could be a factor, too. So there's a lot of that to, to that. So. All right. <laughs> Keith says, sitting on the podcast makes me start searching for gear to buy. Yeah, I, I get that, too, when I'm listening to podcasts, I'll be like, oh, I need to, <laughs> yeah, you, some subject comes up, and next thing you know, got to check out things. Uh, we have uh, Steven, is this Steven? I want to make sure. Steven says, repaired a broken neck. It now has a hump going down at the third fret. Uh, okay, if I level the fretboard, will I need to replace uh, the MOP, uh, the mo uh, Mother of Pearl block inlays? Uh, well, here's the deal. It, you're, ta you're talking about obviously pulling the frets and then planing down the, the fretboard, um, you know, with like a radius block or something. Um, it, really, it's going to be this simple. It's just going to be how deep are you going to go down? I would say, uh, I would say you're not likely going to go through them. You know what I mean? Um, it's not likely. It's possible, though, but it's not likely. That's probably the best answer I can give you. Not likely, but possible. So you're taking the chance, but I would, if I was a betting person, I'd say you'd be fine. Um, they're they're thick enough to where you're, you're not going to have to take off as much material as you think. Everybody thinks there's it's dr more dramatic than it is, but it's not as dramatic as you think. Uh, Charles did a super chat. Thank you. Chad said, regarding the Marshall Studio heads, have you tried the Plexi? Yeah, of course. I had, I've had. i owned them all at this point. Uh, I saw your JCM 100 and the Silver Jubilee demos. Uh, thoughts on the Plexi as well as the Rev G20. I have not tried Rev stuff, so I, I can't speak to it. On the Plexi style studio head, here's I have, I have a uh, 1986X, which is the 50 watt version of that same amp. And... Um, <clears throat> they are very similar in in how they are. My issue is uh, the 50 watt version, in my opinion, has more bass fullness, just a little bit more, and um, and it does. After, other than that, and it kicks a crap ton louder. Uh, the 20 watt Plexi style amp. The problem I have is, I remember they're not the exact same amp. They're just I'm just comparing because I had them too. Um, what I'll tell you is the 20 watt plexi is still freaking loud. It's as a pedal platform. If you're going to use it for that, you're going to be fine. It's going to just, you know, have it clean, run some pedals through it. You'll be absolutely fine. However, as cranking it like a plexi, uh, you're going to have to run it through some kind of attenuation anyways. I like, unless you're, you know, unless you can just be as loud as you want all the time. The only thing I hate about that is it's loud. That's what I said. It's loud like the plexi. So you're not really saving anything, <laughs> right? Uh, by the time it's cranking too, even at five watt mode, it's still loud. It's not as loud, like I said, as a fifty watt, but it's still loud. It's not like it's. Uh, I don't. I don't want to be like it's. It's usable. It's still not usable. It's too loud for most situations. So you have to run through attenuation. If you're going to do that, that's why I said, oh screw it, I'll just use my fifty watt at this point. The other thing is, is that it, when it is loud, it doesn't thump. It doesn't push like the fifty watt head. So. To me, the 50 watt was the better amp. Keep in mind, though, there's no logical reason I can come up with why the 50 watt head is $2,500 versus the $1,300 or $1,400 that Mini Plexi is now. Um, but I've said this before: the main reason I didn't keep the Mini Plexi is I have a, a JC, I have not JC, I have a JM. Where's it at? I have a JMP. I'm looking right now. JMP 2061 which is a hand-wired 20-watt head. It's not because it's hand-wired. I just say that because that's what it's described as. Uh, it's essentially, it does, it does, and it's loud. It's not as loud as the 20-watt studio plexi, and so I prefer it. 
But again, it's more expensive. Even used, you're going to be looking at 1500 bucks. So, uh, great amp. I still prefer, but it's just me. I still prefer my Freedmans. I would still buy, before I buy the Plexi. I bought all the Marshalls. That's why I bought them. I bought them because I was looking for something. What I ended up set, st settling on was the Freedmans. I don't know what it is there. It's like, you got to figure out how you got to figure out what you were okay to be unhappy with, with the Freemans. I think they can do volume way low or they can do a quieter volume than the Marshall for sure. They get more gain than the Marshalls at lower volumes and they sound Marshall-esque and they really have a great tone that I love. However, I think the Marshalls have more sustain than the Freedmans. So it's like when I play my Marshall, I go, yeah, this is the classic sound with the sustain I like. When I play the free one, that sounds like a modded Marshall. It's got things I like about Marshall, but it's got a newer character to it. At some point, I'm always a little unhappy, but I, I can use the Freedmans more. They are just more expensive as well, though. Josh Take Finnegan something <laughs> says, first live show in months. <laughs> I'm just going with Josh. Oh, Josh. Tosh Jake. Did I say Josh Take? I think I flipped it. Maybe I have a little, <laughs> maybe I'm dyslexic. Tosh Jake says, first live show in months, usually miss as I'm opening up the guitar store in Australia for Saturday trade at this time. Do you like the new FGN uh, boundary series models? I haven't seen, well, I have, I, I don't know if they're different than the FGNs I've played. Five ninety nine. dollars uh, U.S. for a main Japan a Super Stratatelli. We can't beat that. But that's, you're in Australia. Is that what they are here? That's the problem. Like, you know, I know in Australia, the problem is, is like it's $3,000 for a made Mexico guitar right now. That's the problem in the U.S. Some of the, some of the guitars like that, the FGNs, you play them and they're really great. Like in, in, in everywhere else in the world, they're 600 bucks. But by the time they get here, they're $900. So I'd have to look. I'll look. I'll look tonight uh, when I index the show. Because, um, yeah, 600 bucks is really cool. And I'm a big fan of the FGN stuff. Okay. Telecaster48 says, Hey, Phil, thanks for the great information and entertainment on your Friday podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. I like, thank you guys for, especially Telecaster for, you know, I mean, $20 super chat. Thank you guys for super chatting that you like the show. It's really cool. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> right now Magic Man's like 3K, what? Yeah, by the way, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. I think it's like $3,000. Uh, I don't know, Australian. It's, three, it's the equivalent of $3,000 for a main Mexico guitar. Um, okay, let's, let's do the giveaway. We're at the end of the show. Let's do a giveaway. I'm going to be giving away a guitar crate. So this is the guitar crate I used last week. This is going to go to I'm Not Old and Vintage. Oh, and by the way, I'm Not Old and Vintage. I think I, I thought it'd be fun until I ship this thing to you, because I'm not shipping it until I get the new one, because I need something to, to talk about. This is a guitar crate. And like we talked last week, it comes with all this, this stuff. Ooh, you get a box of stuff. It's basically you send in a gift to yourself. You're like, what did I send myself this month? I don't know until I get it. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to told, I told I'm, uh, I'm not old and vintage. I throw extra stuff in here. So I'm going to throw this in there. Not that. <laughs> what is it? I got it somewhere. Did I already put it in there? This is going to be a good show. That's, I got to be it. I'm going to give you one of these. Cool slides I did a video on recently from Black Mountain Picks. So this is a forty dollars spot slide. This is cool. So I have some of these slides right there. So I'm gonna. So when you get your box, that'll be in there. I figured until like I said, until I ship your box, I'll just keep adding stuff to it, like I told you, and I'll show you, so you know what you're gonna get. So guitar crate. We have to give away a guitar crate. How do we do that? Uh, how do we give away this guitar crate? We, uh, to get the guitar crate, you have to be in the U.S. because they got to ship to the U.S. I'm sorry, all the people that are not in the U.S. I am working on that. That is the uh, definitely the biggest priority I have to give away is to add in everyone around the world. It's coming. It's not just the price of shipping to you guys. That's a huge obstacle to overcome. It's the fact that to do that, and I'm not, I, I, it's hard for me to ask you know, did somebody do something? I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. In other words, I don't go to the post office and fill out all the custom work. Uh, my wife does. So 
you know, it's, it's a process for her. So I got to ask her to do it. And, uh, and so once I get that done, which I think I've got <laughs> willing to do this stuff, uh, we can do it. Um, let's do, I don't want to just, um, Hey, do me, do me a favor. Give me your best or no favorite best, uh, type in your favorite, uh, army of darkness quote from Ash. What's your favorite quote? And then I'll pick one real quick for those of you. And some of you guys are probably Googling it. So I'm going to pick obviously the fastest ones because I don't want you to Google it. Okay. Anyone? Anyone got a cool Ash a quote? Okay, this is my boomstick. I like that one. Let's see if I get another one. This is my boomstick. Ah, uh, Fox in the House, you got, got beat by Bud. He was a little faster. <laughs> Desert Dog, you will die. That's not Ash, though, but yeah, I still like the quote. Uh, Okay. Groovy. Groovy's a good one. You know what, Bert? I'm going with you. Good, bad, I'm the guy with the gun. Uh, You know what? I love that one. So, Bert, you won. Bert Smith, you're getting a a $45 value guitar crate box. All you have to do is email me at pmcknight7 at gmail, uh, or they ask me your gear. It doesn't matter. Just email me and say you won, and send me your address, and I will get that to TJ at Guitar Crate, and he'll get that out. I didn't know if I said it last week, but I'm saying it now. You get next month's one, so just you'll get it. At, you know, For you, it's no big deal. You're going to get it like next week, but it's going to be a week out when you get it. They'll ship you out one. So, Bert, thank you. That's a great quote. Thank you everybody for everybody else who did a great quote. Thank you, everybody else, for hung out, who hung out this week. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Please look for this Sunday's uh, show. It's a 30-minute show with me and Doug Pinnock. Uh, the guitar player. Well, he's the guitar player of his new album. He's the bass player and the singer, of course, of King's X, uh, one of my favorite bands for sure. And uh, these are going to be uh, more, I'm going to do, I told you guys I'm going to do more bonus podcast, podcast-esque, podcast-esque, podcast-esque. <laughs> That's too tricky. Podcast-esque interviews. <laughs> so they won't be in a place of any of the Friday shows. It'll just be, and so it'll always be a Friday show. And then I'll do the extra interview ones, but this one was really good. He was really cool, chill dude. And it was really fun. So on that note, I'm gonna let you guys go. I want to thank you guys again. I want to thank John and his brother, William for the amazing gift. That was really cool. I know some of you guys also sent me some cool stuff. Like I said, I'll do a, a unboxing. I just, like I said, if it's I just get in the time, right? Just got to put all in the time. So as always, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Till next week, I guess I'll just say, uh, know your gear. All right, goodbye.